Alrighty, well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Dauphiny and I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. And I would like to welcome back uh, one of our past presenters, Joel Mott from the New Jersey Pinelands Commission. Um, Joe is going to be doing another talk about the Pinelands today, but this time he's gonna be talking about the flora and fauna that you can find throughout um, the entirety of the Pinelands. Um, Joel currently leads the Commission's efforts to raise awareness and understanding of the Pinelands. With experience in both environmental and historical interpretation, his career has comprised a wide range of positions, from park ranger to museum curator. In the past, he has held interpretive and forestry positions at several national parks, historic sites, and forests, including Beaverhead National Forest and Big Hole National Battlefield in Montana, Gettysburg National Military Park, and Eisenhower National Historic Site in Pennsylvania. So welcome back, Joe. We are very excited um, to have you. Uh, thanks so much. It's uh, great to be here and good to, good to share the, the Pine Lands, Pine Barrens, uh, you know, uh, flora and fauna with everybody out there. All right. Before we jump into Joel's uh, presentation, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. Um, first and foremost, if we will be taking your questions. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them at any time using the Q&A or the chat feature in the Zoom dashboard. Um, there will be a survey available at the end of the program. So if you have time, we ask that you please complete the survey. We always love hearing your feedback. And if you want more information on the Pinelands, including the critters and the plants, um, you can visit the Pinelands Commission's website at www.nj.gov forward slash Pinelands. Um, and there's all sorts of things that you can get lost in on that website. So I encourage you, you ought to, to check that out at your leisure. Um, one last thing before we jump in is just a brief overview of the Zoom dashboard. This is what your dashboard should look like if you're using a PC or a Mac. Um, if you're using a mobile device, the dashboard may look a little bit different, but all the features will still be there. In the bottom left-hand corner, you will see your audio settings. So if you're using an external listening device, such as headset or earbuds, you can make sure that they are properly connected there. At any point during the presentation, if you have any issues, there is a raise hand button here in the middle. You can click on that. That'll alert me and I will message you in Zoom and hopefully be able to solve your problem. And lastly, again, if you have any questions or have any comments you would like to share, there is the Q&A and the chat buttons. You can use either of them to get in contact with myself and Joel. So that is everything that I have for you. So it is my pleasure to turn it over to Joel. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, with that, I will uh, share my screen. Okay. Uh, good uh, afternoon. I guess we're after 12, so it is uh, noontime now. And um, thanks for having me back. Uh, today's focus is going to be on the, the fauna and fauna, uh, plants and animals. Um, and to start out with, I, I figured uh, when I'm not working and when I'm out enjoying the Pinelands, one of the things I'd like to do is uh, spend some time fishing. And I'm sitting here, uh, fortunately, holding a chain pickerel. That's about 25 inches long. And uh, the chain pickerel are probably the largest uh, predator fish that you find in the Pinelands, um, native fish that occur naturally. And uh, this one, as I said, was probably about 25 inches. I've, hold, I've heard a lot of stories uh, from the old timers that uh, they used to be over 30 inches. I've even heard stories of some over 36 inches or over three feet long. Uh, it would be pretty scary. Uh, they're pretty much a, a smaller version of the northern pike. Uh, we don't have pike down in this area, but we do have the, the chain pickerel. And uh, that's where we're going to start today. So just to kind of set the stage, uh, I have a couple uh, quick slides to kind of uh, show the Pinelands area in its entirety. Uh, we're looking at a map right now that shows the 1.1 uh, million acres of the Pinelands National Reserve. Um, Thanks to uh, Federal National Parks Act of 1978, it established the Pinelands National Reserve, uh, followed a year later by the um, Pinelands Protection Act. This was by the state of New Jersey, and that was in 1979. And that created the New Jersey Pinelands Commission, who created a Pinelands um, Comprehensive Management Plan. And that was signed by Governor Brendan Byrne on uh, January 14th, uh, 1981. Uh, so we're, you know, 43, 44 years down the road. And, uh, you know, 1.1 um, million acres, that's actually 22% of the state of New Jersey uh, that's within the Pinelands. Okay. 
Let me move that over here. Um, I just put the chat up if anybody has questions. I'll try to catch them as I go on. Uh, this next image really kind of shows um, some of the land use of the area. Uh, basically, we have a very large uh, undeveloped um, upland area, um, kind of weave through a fair amount of uh, wetlands and water. Um, between the two, that makes up about 80% of the uh, the pine lands. Up, and I see a, I see a first question. Um, I use the words back forth interchangeably, pine lands, pine barrens. Uh, pine barrens is definitely the traditional name for the area. Um, when they started to you know, think about protection and, and legislation in the 70s, that's when you start to see that name pine lands kind of come up. Uh, I actually graduated from Pinelands Regional High School and I work for the Pinelands Commission today. So Pinelands rolls off my tongue pretty easily. Um, when I do think about the historical context and the area's history, I tend to move back into Pine Barrens, but to me, they're, they're one and the same. Um, so this is pretty interesting. If 80% of the area is forest or wetlands, uh, what does that leave? Um, and that leaves about 20%. And that's where you're gonna see most of the population uh, the, within the Pinelands um, area. Uh, the way the Pinelands rules were set up, uh, they really want to kind of guide uh, further development um, going forward into areas that had infrastructure like water and public sewer. And uh, over the last, say, you know, 43 years, like we talked about earlier, in roughly 13% of the pine lands, more than 75% of the development has occurred. So that pine lands plan, that comprehensive management plan was really set up to uh, allow growth to take place in areas that hopefully wouldn't uh, take away from the, the natural intact resources. And that's what we've seen over the last, uh, you know, 43, 44 years. Okay. Um, the basis of everything I talk about in the Pinelands is really the water. Uh, the water above the ground, the water below the ground. Um, it's where just about, you know, a good majority of the people in South Jersey get their drinking water. But all the plants and animals I'm going to talk about are really dependent on that water. Um, below the pine lands, we think there's an aquifer. It's called the Kirkwood Cohansey. It's named for two uh, geologists. And really, the best way to describe it is it's layers of sand below the surface. And within those layers of sand, um, we think that the area can hold 17.7 trillion gallons of water, uh, which is one of the largest uh, aquifers, uh, definitely on the East Coast, probably in the country. And, um, you know, it's just a huge amount of water. It's critical for us, but it's also critical uh, for the Pinelands ecosystems to have that water. Um, if you cover the whole state, maybe 10 foot um, deep in water, that's an example of how much water we think is below the ground. It's not like a lake under the ground. It's literally layers of sand and the water goes between the nooks and crannies of all those uh, pieces of sand. So it's basically an aquifer is an area of sand that holds water, and we're able to um, um, have a well and bring that water back up. But it's important to think that the water on the surface is connected to the water below. And that's why we're very careful with our wetlands where development occurs because we don't want to jeopardize that water source. Basic pinelands characteristics. What's different from the Pinelands and other places? Uh, the first thing you notice right away is the water and the soil has a very low pH. Uh, nice Pinelands characteristic stream is going to have a pH of 3.5 to 5.5, which is very low or what some people say is very acidic. Uh, general tap water is usually around 7, which is around neutral. Uh, so most of the plants and animals we'll talk about today are really key to those low um, numbers, those low pH numbers. When the pH changes over time, you're going to start to see many other uh, plants come in, animals come in that are tolerant of that pH, and you'll lose the native pineless plants. Um, the soil, if you've lived in the area, if you tried to farm in the area, you know the soil is very sandy, and uh, it can rain in the afternoon. And there could be a forest fire in, uh, excuse me, it could rain in the morning and there could be a forest fire in the afternoon because that water literally just hits that sand and drops right down uh, below the surface. So again, many of the plants are very fire tolerant, also somewhat drought tolerant. Um, 
we do get a lot of rain. Most of the time, on average, it's over 40 inches. I would say over the last, say, five, six years, we've probably received over 60 inches of rain. So uh, we get a lot of rain, um, but the area is able to accommodate that rain. And um, we'll show it a little bit later, but if you ever go on canoeing or kayaking in the area, uh, you know the water's kind of got a dark color. A lot of people refer to it as cedar water, and that's from all the vegetation that falls into that water breaking down. There's also some interactions with oxygen and iron in the soil and kind of creates like a rust. And that's what you see uh, in that, you know, kind of dark water uh, that the pine lands is known for. Another important thing to think about is the water table. Um, the water table is basically where that aquifer is. And there are times in the winter in particular where the water table comes to the surface uh, in some places. Um, besides us, the vegetation actually uses more water. So in the fall, when the trees come off the leaves and the trees stop uh, and the flowers stop blooming, that's when that water table will come back up. And once the growing season starts, which is about this time of year, once things start to grow again in the pine lands, they start to drain down that water table. So the water table goes up and down based on the amount of water that's coming back up to the surface. Okay, um, here we go. Uh, this is a typical upland uh, pine lands area um, or pine barrens, if you'd like. This is uh, from the Apple Pie Hill Fire Tower, and it's looking out across uh, this large area of uh, upland um, pines. Uh, if we go a little bit closer, you look down, and this is a very typical upland scene that you can see throughout the, the pine lands area. I see there's a question. Let me uh, check. Okay. All right, I'll pass on that. Okay, so uh, this road is, uh, I think this might be Baptist Road. It's just out in the middle between Route 72 and Chatsworth somewhere. And uh, you could take this picture in a thousand places throughout the Pinelands. So this is a very typical upland uh, pine scene. And I took this picture, I want to say, uh, last month when I was out in the field uh, measuring some water levels. Uh, first thing I want to talk about, sometimes I uh, forget, I don't know how I can forget, but whenever I'm out and about in the pine lands, I always think about a couple things in particular. Uh, and ticks uh, come to mind, first of all. Uh, the three ticks you see there are the deer tick, uh, the lone star tick, and the dog tick. Uh, the dog tick doesn't seem to bother humans. I do find them on my dogs a lot, but uh, both the Lone Star and the deer tick are the two ticks that I uh, tend to see. Um, after the first frost, they tend to kind of lose some of their vigor, but literally anytime it's above freezing and you're out and about in Pine Barrens, uh, you can definitely pick up some of these ticks. Um, as a rule, when I'm out in the field or you know on a hike, when I come home, I always check and uh, you do find them from time to time. Up here in the corner, um, this is a tick bite I have on my shoulder. I've had this probably for about two to three weeks now. And uh, once they do get you, they tend to take a while to heal. Um, but it's really important if you're out and about and you do get a tick on you, you want to get it off within 24 to 36 hours. Uh, so that's why every night when I get home, I do take some time to check. Uh, you know, when I know it's really the tickiest season, when they're, most of them are out there is going to be from June to, say, the first frost. I'll tend to wear long socks, long boots, and I even actually wear some clothes underneath my clothes that are very thin with very tight um, uh, around my wrist and my ankle just to prevent uh, the, the ticks. And the, and the triggers, uh, triggers are scarier. Uh, triggers tend to be around in, um, the end of July through September, October, uh, and they're actually a little mite. And uh, you can see there's a, one on, a, on my finger and uh, they're very small, uh, but what they do is they able to basically bite you. And once they bite you, their saliva, your body reacts to, and uh, it gets very itchy. And in both cases, both the tick bite and the trigger bite, you're probably gonna do more damage scratching than you are going to from the actual bite from the insect. Hydrocortisone does relieve the itch to some degree, um, but particularly with the trigger, when I've gotten messed with triggers, it's about two weeks of uh, scratching and itching. There's not really much you can do to, to avoid them uh, once you accept, take those precautions ahead of time. Uh, so that's what I want to say about ticks and triggers. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, 
I try to stay out of high grass, high grassy areas. This tends to be where you're going to get some of the ticks, particularly the larval ticks, which are the very small ones, once they start to hatch. And uh, again, anytime really from June on through to uh, you know that first frost. I usually celebrate every year once uh, that the first frost uh, comes. It's usually around the end of October is when we have it. Okay, uh, here is the pitch pine. The pitch pine is the most dominant tree in the entire state of New Jersey. Um, there's a lot in the pine lands, but they're also spread out throughout the area. Um, the pitch pine has two types of cones we know, uh, a regular cone and a serotonous cone. Most tall pitch pines have about 75% regular cones that open with the heat from the sun and about 25 that really only open uh, when it's very hot, around 1,200 degrees, and they're the serotonous cones. And uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, there's a, definitely a relationship with fire. So when there's a forest fire through one of the pitch pine forest, as it gets hot, what's it going to do? It's going to release those cones on an area that has just been burned. And the first thing to grow back generally is going to be more pitch pine. So that is really why pitch pines are the most uh, you know, dominant vegetation uh, throughout the, uh, the area. Let's look at the chat here. I see there's a couple of questions. Um, okay. Okay, our doggy. Just some questions about the ticks. Um, when I remove the ticks, uh, I try to get them all completely out. So from time to time, I'll look around and I'll find one that's already bit me. And I do the best I can to completely remove all parts of the tick out of out of the the area and uh, that's imp that's important to do it's hard sometimes because they're in odd awkward places but i usually ask my wife to help me and we'll we'll try to do what we can to to get all the remnants of that that take away um there are some other pines in the area uh, one of them that kind of gets uh short sh short shaft sometimes is the short leaf pine and uh, I see the shortleaf pine pretty much spread out through the Pinelands area. Uh, and then particularly down south, as you get around, say, Belle Plaine uh, in Cape May County, you're going to start to see the bigger Virginia pine. So there are other pines in the Pinelands besides the pitch pine. Um, uh, you can see here the shortleaf has got some smaller cones, and generally there's a lot more of them. That's a, a good typical picture of a uh, shortleaf pine. Um, shortleaf pines only have two needles in a cluster. So all these clusters are just two needles. Pitch pine always has uh, three. Uh, and I can't remember off the top of my head what uh, the Virginia does. But um, pitch pines always have three clusters and short leaf always have two. Uh, the other tree that dominates uh, the Pine Barrens area or pine lands is the black jack oak. Uh, the pitch pine and the black jack oak, uh, they've kind of got a club-like um, leaf. And you can see it's very shiny on one side. And they are by far the two, you know, most trees that are found in the Pine Barrens, uh, blackjack and pitch pine. Um, most areas are a pine forest that kind of leans towards oak, depending on how much fires occurred there. Uh, we do know that over time, if we remove fire from the equation, oak will supersede um, and take over the pine. So the fire that takes place in the Pine Barrens really keeps pine dominant, whereas in areas without so much fire, over time, you'll start to see oak uh, kind of move forward. So most of your upland forests are going to be pine to oak or pine pine, depending on how you want to describe it. And they transition into the wetlands areas. Those transition areas where you'll see a lot of um, both upland and lowland vegetation are what we call a pitch pine lowland. and um, a characteristic species that I see in those lowlands all the time are what we would call a cat briar or smilex. It's those real thick, green, nasty briars. And uh, as you're going from the uplands into the wetlands, going from a, a, a dry area to a wet area, there's almost a wall of that smilex that you run into sometimes. In those wetland areas, we have two basic types uh, of forest. We have a hardwood swamp. And that's where you're going to find your cherry trees, your gum trees, your maple trees. Uh, and then the other distinct type of swamps we have are the Atlantic white cedar swamps. 
And uh, that's where you're going to find trees like the Atlantic white cedar. You're going to find sphagnum moss and a whole host of uh, some of the animals that we're going to talk about as we go forward here um, along the way. Um, kind of transition into some of the plants. Uh, this is a cedar swamp. And in May, one of the first uh, blooming um, lilies that comes up is what is called a swamp pink lily. Uh, swamp pink lily, I would describe as a plant that likes its feet wet. So you're going to find that in areas that are wetter, where you see some standing water from time to time. And uh, it's a federally uh, threatened and protected plant. Um, there are another 850 species that occur in the pinelands. 92 of them that are considered threatened and endangered. Um, there's a few that are pretty rare. In particular, uh, there's a pick green's morning glory, and we're going to show you some pictures of the bog asphodel, which is only found here in the pinelands. Uh, and I will note as we go through that there are also 27 wild orchids um, that live in the pinelands. So when you think about it, you know, the old pine barrens comes from the idea that it was very barren, like you couldn't grow field crops, you couldn't grow some of the agricultural products that the European settlers wanted to grow. And that's where that word pine barrens comes from. But we know today that it's really not that barren because of all the wildlife and all the, the plants in particular that we're gonna see. Okay, uh, here we go. This is an upland plant. This is the uh, pink lady slipper. Um, pink lady slippers uh, tend to grow in upland areas. And they have a very interesting uh, symbiotic relationship with the fungi in the soil around them. And the thing about uh, lady slippers is when you see them, uh, you should never try to transplant them because they are completely geared to grow in the environment that they're in. And they have certain relationships symbiotic with the fungi that's in the soil that they are. So if you take them from the forest and try to bring them home, they're never going to live. So we always tell people when you see a uh, pink lady slipper, please leave it there and uh, so somebody else can enjoy it and it'll come back. But we really encourage people not to try to take them and, and transplant them. Um, we're pretty interesting and fortunate that we have a mix. We have uh, plants like the broom crowberry. Broom crowberry is a northern plant that grows in the tundras of Canada and, uh, Canada and Alaska. The furthest south that ever comes is the uh, pine barrens. And then turkey beard here is a southern plant. It grows down in Georgia for the most part. The furthest north that's ever found is here in the pine barrens area. So we have an overlap where some plants from the north come as far south as the pine barrens, and some plants from the south come as far north as the pine barrens. So it's very unique in that relationship. Um, here's one of our real special habitats. Uh, this is the pine plains. Uh, we have four distinct areas of pine plains, um, kind of near uh, Route 539 and Warren Grove, right on the Ocean County, Burlington County border. And um, these areas, actually, both the pine and the, some of the oak species are stunted in growth. There's been a lot of, lots of research. There's no definite answer. Um, one of the biggest differences we know of is the pine cones on these little um, pine trees are mostly serotonous. So these little trees have about 90% serotonous cones, only about 10% regular cones. And that's the biggest difference we can see um, throughout the pine plains. You could walk, I took this picture out on the pine plains. You could walk 100 yards from I took this picture and there's big pine trees that grow 60, 70 feet tall. Um, but over time, most people think it has to do with the fire and the soil, maybe the nutrients in the soil uh, because of the fire, but those areas are, are pretty distinct. They're globally rare. And uh, one of the reasons why the area has been named the Biosphere Reserve is those distinct, um, you know, pine plains type um, pygmy pine habitat that we're known for. Uh, the best way to see it is if you drive down Route 539, um, just before you hit the Garden State Parkway, you're going to go through one of the patches of the Pine Plains. It's about three miles to the north of where Route 539 intersects the Garden State Parkway. Uh, some of the plants that you can see out in those areas, uh, prickly pear cactus, for instance, is pretty, pretty rare, but people do find it. I've seen a lot of it down at Wells Mills County Park. Um, 
mountain laurel. Mountain laurel blooms generally the last week of May, the first uh, week of June, and that's probably one of the prettiest, prettiest times to drive around the Pinelands. Here's that Pickering's Morning Glory, which is a very rare plant. Along a lot of the roadsides, you'll see the Pine Barrens Heather as it gets more towards summer. And then uh, here's bushy beard grass. Bushy beard grass is probably one of my favorite plants because it's really more of a wetland plant. Um, but where you see it a lot of times on the side of the roads or in areas uh, that you look relatively dry. And what that means is where you do see bushy beard, beard grass, that means the water table comes very close to the surface. So that is a definite indicator plant and it indicates that the water table comes close to uh, the surface where you see that growing. And that's the bushy beard grass right there. Um, we, uh, we were talking, I was talking with Andrew a little bit earlier about wildfires and prescribed burning. Uh, the New Jersey Forest Fire Service uh, tries to burn uh, in February and March is the controlled burn season. And they try to burn 20 to 25,000 acres each year. And the idea is for them to burn the fuels, uh, which are the pine needles, the leaves, all the debris on the ground. So there's not an uncontrolled fire um, later on. Uh, so that season is generally February and March, which makes a lot of sense because the forest fire season itself has always been known as early spring. Say uh, April through June is when the worst forest fires have occurred in the Pinelands. That's even though it rains a lot, but that's when the humidity is still low and uh, there's a lot of winds. And so traditionally our forest fire season is that you know early spring, April through June, April through May, uh, that's historically when the worst fires have been. Uh, let's play a, a sound here to give you guys an idea about what a fire sounds like. That's probably a, a, you know the sound of a controlled burn in the background. Uh, this image down here in the lower corner was out on the Pine Plains, and this is two weeks after a fire. So in two weeks, the forest already starts to come back. This is the pine tree growing, and this is an oak coming out. And then this picture over here is six weeks after the fire. So when you hear a fire destroy the forest in the Pine Barrens, that's kind of a misnomer. Uh, what the fire really does is kind of regenerate things and kind of restart it. And in most cases, it's probably the best thing for uh, those uh, pine lands or Pine Barrens habitats. Um, uh, a couple things that we that grow naturally and wild here. I'll kind of use them as a transition in some ways. Uh, in the upland area, you're gonna find the high bush blueberry. Um, and then as you're getting to the wetlands, you're gonna to start to find the cranberries. Um, but these are both native plants that occur naturally throughout the area. Over time, both have been adapted to agriculture and are the backbone of the economy in some ways in South Jersey. Uh, they're two of the largest natural resources that we're able to harvest. And as I said before, they're both native pinelands plants that occur here naturally, and you can find a well, well away from a farm uh, just growing on their own. Um, in the wetland areas, as we said earlier, wetlands uh, compromise or comprise about 35% of the pinelands area. Um, we talked about the cedar swamps, the hardwood swamps. Um, there's also savannas, and even a lot of places, the pinelands go right out to the bay. So a lot of our coastal marshes are within the Pinelands National Reserve. Um, this is a savanna here. Uh, savannas are really interesting. Um, they have a wetland soil, which is a muckier soil, so it holds the water longer. But in the savanna, it's open. There's not as many trees, and it allows a lot more sunlight. And in those savanna areas is where you're going to find many of the rare Pinelands plants Many of the orchids we're going to see, some of the carnivorous plants like the pitcher plants, um, and those savannas are, are really key to the area because that's where you're going to find a lot of those uh, plants. And the same thing like the uplands, again, the pH is very, very low and the soil is very low in nutrients. Um, so like I said, that's 35% of the area. Some of those orchids uh, are things like the meadow beauty. Um, this is Erisufla or the dragon's mouth orchid. Uh, down here is grass pink. Over here is rose pagonia. And uh, most of these are kind of showier. They'll start to bloom as it gets into June and July, depending on the weather each year is a little different. But these are some of those really delicate uh, orchids that the, the pine barrens are known for. Uh, some other ones. 
uh, the orange fringed, fringed orchid, the southern yellow orchid. Um, the pine barrens gentian is a fall bloomer, so they tend to bloom in October, September, and August. Uh, they are a wetland plant, but they grow in areas where there's like on the sides of the road where there's a ditch because it holds more water. So a lot of the signs that say do not mow, you see when you're driving around, are because this plant right here, the pine barrens gentian, will grow in those areas. Uh, Golden Cresc is typically found in some of those savanna areas. Uh, it's also known as elk horn or, uh, because it looks like a set of antlers. Um, also right here is that bog asphodel. A long time ago, uh, bog asphodel was thought to also grow in, say, North Carolina and South Carolina, but today its distribution is limited to the Pinelands. So there's no place else in the world you're going to find this plant except the, the New Jersey Pinelands. So that's you know a pretty special plant. It's a protected plant, um, and a lot of it are in wetlands. There's going kind to of be really no development in those wetlands areas, so that's, that protects that plant from uh, losing its, its habitat. Here are some of the carnivorous plants. Um, probably the most known is the pitcher plant. Um, bugs can kind of come in. There's little points here, kind of stickers, so they can't crawl out. And once they get their wet, their wings wet, they have a hard time flying out. So if you look at most pitcher plants, you're going to see there's a few insects in them. Um, we've got threadleaf or longleaf sundew, also the roundleaf sundew. And uh, the, the bugs are then are attracted to the sticky surface because it's sweet. But then over time, the plant is able to absorb um, that insect's body into, into its uh you know, it takes its minerals and its nutrients. Um, bladderwort, here is a horn bladderwort, and there's their purple bladderwort. Uh, these are the blooms, but they both have a um, kind of a pouch that goes down into the water below the water surface, and that pouch works as a filter, and they're able to filter in some of the microorganisms that are within the water. So, uh, and I think they're, the purple bladderwort in particular is one of the prettiest little, tiny, tiny little blossoms. But there are some of our carnivorous plants. Um, here's a couple really specialists. Uh, the curly grass fern is a fern that's botanists have been coming to the Pinelands area since the 1700s to find. Uh, it grows in those savanna areas. It's only maybe uh, one or two inches high. You can see it's got some curly cues and it goes up to the top where it's actually like a little fiddlehead if you catch it right. I think I took this picture in uh, Early, it was May, uh, many, many years ago, and usually around um, the curly grass fern, you're going to find the sphagnum moss. There's a whole bunch of varieties of sphagnum moss in the Pinelands. Um, it has an incredible ability to hold water. Um, one of the industries in the Pinelands uh, used to be uh, a lot of flower shipping, and they would harvest the sphagnum moss, dry it out, and then they would use that to ship flowers all over the area. Um, the Native Americans used it uh, for two things, really. Uh, one thing, they used it to cure diaper rash because it's in that water. That's such a low pH, it almost works as an antiseptic. And uh, it would work as a diaper too because it would absorb, absorb. Uh, during World War I, there's stories of sphagnum moss being harvested in the Pine Barrens and shipped to Europe uh, to help as a dressing for the soldier's wounds because of those antiseptic qualities. Um, well, we're going to kind of transition into the rivers and the streams. Uh, this is a picture I think I took last fall. This is of the Wading River. Um, so, you know, right, like we talked about the cranberries, as you go along these rivers and streams, you can pick cranberries right off the vine uh, as you float by. Uh, some of the other vegetation that you find in those streams are going to be things like Golden Club. Uh, golden Club is pretty interesting. Uh, the old timer name for Golden Club is Never Wet because uh, these leaves look really dry, and even when it rains, the water just hits it and rolls off. So the old-time name for Golden Club is never wet. Uh, tiny cotton grass grows along the, the banks. Uh, there's a whole bunch of reeds and grasses or rushes that grow. Um, another one of my favorite plants is uh, down here in the corner. It's called swaying rush or swaying bulrush. Uh, it's like long hair that just flows back and forth and uh, you find that in, in the, the real characteristic areas of the Pine Barrens. And then here's another one, Alga Pondweed. We're going to see a lot of really small little fish. And uh, between the brush and the pondweed, that's where those little fish are able to kind of get away from those big predators 
uh, the pickerel that we saw at the start, but we'll see them as we go on. Um, we also have uh, the white or the fragrant water lily. In some places, we have a really beautiful pink water lily. And then right along the stream, stream banks, I do see a lot of the swamp azalea, which is another really pretty uh, a plant. I, I believe the swamp azalea is uh, an early bloomer as well. You might see them at the end of May. Um, besides the streams and the swamps and the wetlands, we have what's known as intermittent ponds. And uh, when the water table's high, these ponds are filled up with water. Uh, this is probably a picture from, I would say, I don't know, maybe June. And uh, this is a picture from, say, August. So over time, as the water table drops, uh, those ponds um, lose their water. It's really interesting and um, really good for things like frogs, toads, and salamanders, because they only need water for part of the year. Um, why they're beneficial is because fish can't live in these ponds. If fish were in these ponds, if water stayed in them all year round, then the, the, the tadpoles and the eggs would be eaten up by the fish. Um, so it's really important. We have a very diverse suite of uh, frogs and toads, and these intermittent ponds are really a key uh, to that diversity. Um, speaking of uh, frogs, here is the Pine Barrens tree frog. Um, it's one of uh, 500 animals that occur in the area. Uh, there are 43 that are threatened and endangered. Um, I'll date myself a little bit. When I was a kid growing up, the tree frog was an endangered species. Over the last 40 some years, it's been preserved. And today we know it as a threatened species. We still protect it, but we know the habitat is in much better shape and the populations are uh, much higher. Uh, here are some of our other frogs and toads. Uh, this time of year, we're starting to hear them call. Uh, the first ones that we've been hearing calling are say the spring peepers right now. Um, this is a sound you may be familiar with. Um, also starting to call this time of year is the leopard frog. <laughs> Generally what's happening is when the frogs are calling, uh, it's primarily male frogs and they're calling for attention to find uh, the female frogs. Um, We'll go through them a little bit, but let's just uh, go on through. This is an example of a Pine Barrens tree frog. Uh, and this is a Pine Barrens tree frog calling. Um, so generally, as the frogs are calling, what they're going to do is they're going to come together. And uh, I was out in the field not too long ago, or in March, and uh, this is the result. So these are egg masses that are already from this year where the, uh, the frogs have come together, they've made it, and they've deposited their eggs. Uh, what's going to happen over the next uh, few weeks is these eggs are going to eventually develop into tadpoles. And then from tadpoles, they're going to develop into full-fledged frogs or toads. And they're going to walk right out of the pond uh, so it doesn't affect them when the pond goes dry depending on how the summer goes and how much rain we get um, so that this these intermittent ponds are you know pretty key to that uh, to that habitat um, here are some of the other frogs that are kind of found on the border you find them in the pine lands but you find them also on the edge of the pine lands uh, things like the chorus frog chorus frogs are the first frogs to call they generally call in early february um, wood frogs are early callers as well. Um, they have uh, the cricket frog. There's also pickerel frogs. We've got both a northern and a southern gray tree frog. So like the pine barrens tree frog and the spring peeper, these are true tree frogs. Um, uh, right here is the bullfrog. Uh, now, bullfrogs are kind of an indicator species. Um, we know that bullfrogs cannot reproduce in areas that have a low pH. The bullfrog needs a pH of probably, say, 6 or so to reproduce. So typically you don't find bullfrogs in the Pine Barrens. 
because the pH is too low for them to sustain. However, if things change and the area changes, um, if that pH raises, how would you re raise the pH? Maybe if you add it phosphorus or nitrogen or in some ways, that pH comes up to a higher level. Now the bullfrogs can reproduce uh, and that can be catastrophic because the bullfrogs eat all the other frogs. So if you now have a population of bullfrogs, they're a predator and they eat other frogs. So they're going to start to think about or you know take a toll on the other frog species in the area. So again, that's uh, as disturbance comes in, things alter. That's where you see that switch from native species to non-native species. Uh, other reptiles and amphibians the area is known for. Um, uh, we have corn snakes are probably one of the prettiest snakes as far as their pattern and their color. The largest snake we know of is probably the pine snake. Uh, corn snakes are endangered. Pine snakes are threatened. Um, salamanders, this is a picture of an eastern tiger salamander that use, utilizes those intermittent ponds uh, to reproduce. Uh, out of the 18 snakes that occur in the pine lands, uh, the only one that's poisonous is the timber rattlesnake. And uh, here's a timber rattlesnake. I'll play that sound for you. Most timber rattlesnakes are around three to four foot in length when they're adult. I have seen a couple a little bit bigger, um, but they're very shy. Uh, the only two people I've ever heard of uh, that have been bit by a rattlesnake in the pine lands were both trying to catch the rattlesnake or pick the rattlesnake up for some crazy reason. Uh, for the most part, they'll go away or they'll just sit still and you'll never know you're close to them. Uh, and if you do hear that rattle, the rattle, basically, they're telling you, OK, I'm, I can't go any further, so don't come any closer to me. So if you ever do hear the rattle, uh, you just want to kind of back out the way you came from and, and leave the snake alone. Um, today, we don't necessarily consider a rattlesnake bite life threatening as long as you can get to a hospital. All the hospitals in the area have the anti venoms and they're able to treat the wound uh, you know, pretty successfully. Um, but if you were stuck out in the woods for a couple of days and you got bit, you might run into some problems. But as long as you can get to safety, uh, you'd be all right. But the chances are very rare and almost always are based the person who gets bit. It's their fault they got bit because they forced the issue uh, with the snake. And that's a, a close up on the rattlesnake. Um, some of the other snake species that we have are throughout the area. One of the smallest ones is this tiny worm snake. Um, uh, we also have the green snake here. They're very showy. Uh, things like the ribbon snake as well. Um, we have a lot of king snakes and we're learning that we generally find king snakes where there's other snakes. Um, one of the main things king snakes eat are other snakes. Uh, that's why they're called the king snake. And um, one of the more characters that we know of is the hognose snake. This is a hognose up here. And uh, they have a few really distinct um, mechanisms they use to protect themselves. Uh, the first mechanism is they flatten their neck and they pretend they're a cobra and try to scare you away. Uh, their next mechanism is they try to rattle their tail like a rattlesnake and try to scare you away then. Their third uh, mechanism is I've actually seen them roll over upside down and just lie there still and actually play dead. Uh, and they are able to emit a very foul odor as well. And I guess their idea is if they couldn't scare them away, maybe they'll think I'm dead and they won't eat me. And uh, they're the three self-defense techniques of the, uh, the hognose snake. Um, native turtles, uh, we've got a wide variety of turtles. The biggest is right here, the snapper. I've seen snapping turtles in far out uh, intermittent ponds in the middle of the woods, but I also see them in a lot of the brackish waters closer to the shore. Um, spotted turtles are very, very small. I find them far deep in the woods in some of those intermittent ponds. Same with the musk turtles. Uh, if I'm kayaking and canoeing, I always see both the red belly and the painted turtle. I think I see more of them than anything. And uh, then here is the box turtle. Uh, the box turtle is more of an upland species, although I do find it in a lot of swampy areas and in wetlands all the time. And this is a male box turtle, you can tell, because he's got a red eye. Uh, generally, the female box turtles aren't as brightly colored, and they have a brown eye. And there are some of our turtles. 
I'm going to check in the chat here just because I see there's a couple questions. Um, so what do we hear in the neighborhood? Uh, yeah, right now you're hearing the spring peepers calling and also some of the chorus frogs. Uh, wood frogs to some degree, uh, they, they call a little bit early too. And the leopard frogs are the ones that are, are calling right now uh, for the most part. Uh, there are a few butterflies. Um, there's a lot of moths and, uh, you know, they 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 kind of come in, they migrate through. And uh, we, we definitely uh, see a very healthy population of both butterflies and moths. Okay. All right. Now, uh, the, the native fish. So when I was talking about some of those small species that hide from the pickerel, down here we have the chain pickerel and its cousin, the redfin pickerel. Redfin are pretty small. They don't grow as big as the chain. Um, but things like the black bandit, the bandit sunfish, the mud sunfish, the pirate perch, the swamp darter, the yellow bullhead, they only occur in those very acidic waters of the Pine Barrens. So you don't find these any other spot in New Jersey, just here in the pines where that water has got that very low pH, like I said, of 3.5 to 5.5. Uh, some kind of border species that we see in other places are like the blue spotted sunfish, the uh, mud minnow, the chub sucker. Uh, and one of the really cool examples uh, that we have here are the American eel. Um, American eels start their life out in the Atlantic Ocean. They come inland to the Pinelands and almost every lake and stream in the Pinelands, you're going to find American eels. Uh, they're, they're very robust. They're some of the, the toughest animals I've ever come across is the uh, the good old meal. They're very slimy. If you ever tried to grab one, they'll roll around your arm, but they leave a very distinct uh, mucousy slime. And uh, once you held an eel, you'll never forget it. Um, birds of play, prey have really come back strong. Uh, you know, we learned from our, our mistakes with DDT, and over time, uh, we've seen a great uh, number of bald eagles come back to the area. There's a thriving uh, osprey population in the Pinelands and along the shore. Um, I see a very regular uh, number of hawks. Here's the red tail, uh, the sharp skin, the coopers. And we've even noticed uh, in the last, you know, say 15 years, the peregrine falcon has certainly made a comeback. And uh, you can see any of these birds almost any time uh, flying around uh, the, the skies of the Pinelands. Here are some of our migratory birds. Uh, some of the warblers have just kind of showed up already this year. Um, we also have uh, things like the nuthatch, the buntings, uh, the goldfinch is the state bird, uh, the yellow-throated warbler. Uh, in the summer, come May, that's when the towhees get here. And they're probably the most prolific migratory bird that kind of fills the, the woods of the Pine Barrens. Um, this right here is a brown thresher. Uh, when they come to the area, uh, you see a lot of them in the pine plains because they don't like to fly high. So they tend to key in on the habitat where the pygmy pines are in those pine plains areas. And uh, we're very fortunate. All of these birds are generally migrating through. Uh, but when they're here, they're eating and they're fueling up. And uh, if you lived in the pinelands or in the shore, you know we've got a lot of mosquitoes and a lot of greenheads. And all these migratory species uh, really help to cut down the numbers of uh, both. Um, here are some more. Uh, I've seen some bluebirds recently. Um, there's the red-headed woodpecker is a threatened uh, species. Uh, the barred owl is one of our owl species that's threatened. Um, the sedge-worn and the severo sparrow. Uh, the sedge-worn is endangered and the severo sparrow is threatened. Um, when I was a kid, I didn't see a lot of turkeys, but they've come back to the area and uh, they've got incredible eyesight and they really don't have a lot of predators because they can fly. So in most places in the Pinelands I drive around today, I see a lot of turkeys, and uh, that's something that's changed over the, the last number of years. Uh, mammals, um, we have red fox. I see them more residential, but I also see them out on the shore in the meadows. Those coastal marshes are a great habitat for the red fox. Uh, the gray fox definitely spends more time far in the woods away from people. It's very rare to see a gray fox. Um, over the last 20, 25 years, coyotes have come into the area. And, uh, you know, the typical Western coyote is a little smaller species. 
Uh, what we have here is known as the Eastern Coyote. And uh, the research has indicated that they're actually about 65% coyote, 25% wolf, and about 10% domestic canine. And uh, they're very adaptive. And uh, I, you know, I think the coyotes will probably be here a lot longer than we will in some ways because they can adapt to any situation. Uh, down here, I've got a uh, bobcat with a question mark and black bear. Um, there has definitely been sightings of both um, throughout New Jersey. Uh, their main populations in both cases are up in the northwest in the Rocky area. Um, particularly bears tend to wander around the state in the springtime, and they always seem to show up in the Pinelands, um, but they've never been a problem. All 21 counties have had reports of bears uh, in New Jersey. Um, the bobcats are pretty interesting. A lot of people say they see bobcats, but uh, we know there's a lot of cameras in the woods these days, and there's really not a lot of pictures. So I just think it's kind of like the bears. Uh, the population's in North Jersey, but they kind of wander through, and every once in a while they'll migrate through the area. So you can see them, but they're they're not very um, you know they're very they're more rare than they are. Uh, a quick look in the chat. I see another question. Uh, not sure if the turkeys are lighter in color. I haven't really noticed the difference. Um, you know, there's some areas where you see a population and the numbers seem to flourish for a while and they kind of ebb and flow, but I see them in a lot more places. Uh, red foxes. Sometimes, I unfortunately, I see the whole gamut on uh, animals um, from snakes to turtles to I've even seen beavers that have been hit. So definitely anything that's out there, uh, the roads definitely cause some issues for some of the uh, some of the wildlife. Okay, uh, some more critters. Uh, any wetland area, particularly in a marsh, you're going to find the muskrat. Um, also, you know, we've got raccoons all over the place. Lots of white-tailed deer. Uh, in particular, when the coyotes showed up, uh, we noticed the deer populations in the pinelands crashed. Uh, they had a really hard time kind of handling life of the coyotes. Um, over time, though, they've kind of figured it out, and now the deer population has come back up uh, in, in the pinelands areas. Um, the, it seemed like maybe the coyotes kind of moved the deer into some residential areas, but now you seem to have a, a both deer in the residential and in the forested areas. Um, with all the wetlands, uh, there's a, a thriving beaver population. Uh, numerous times the beavers have been extinct in New Jersey, but they've always come back uh, some way or shape or form. So beavers are, are pretty industrious and uh, they can definitely have a large effect on an area. And right here is one of my favorite pinelands animals or animals in general, is the flying squirrel. I've uh, had the opportunity to see them a few times uh, out there in the woods, and their eyes are really, really big. Uh, at night, that's almost all you see is just the eyes. Um, and they just glide. You know, they don't, they don't fly. They glide from the tree back down to the ground. Um, pretty cool when you get an opportunity to see them. Um, just to kind of wrap things up as we're getting kind of close, I just want to talk about um, if you're out in the area, you know, you're out enjoying the Pine Barrens. Uh, you want to try to leave no trace, leave nothing behind. I always try to say, if you can, leave it better than you found it. But the best thing you can do is just leave it so somebody else can enjoy it. Uh, as far as driving, I mean, there are literally a thousand dirt roads that crisscross the Pinelands, lots of sugar sand. Um, but as long as you stay on the roads, that's fine. But there's no reason to go off the road into the bogs, the ponds, into the meadows, because then you're just destroying habitat of all the plants and animals we just saw. So it's okay to drive in the Pinelands, but just stay on the roads. Uh, one thing I would discourage is uh, there are rules and regulations. You know, um, four wheelers and other dirt bikes are not, you're not allowed to drive on public roads. So you're not allowed to drive them in the state forest areas. So if you do and you get caught, there's certainly regulations and consequences. Um, same thing with hunting and fishing. I've hunted and fished my whole life in the Pinelands, but you want to know the regulations. There's seasons, there's rules, uh, and you never know who's watching. So there are conservation officers and just people in general. So, uh, you know, that's something to think about. Uh, enjoy, uh, spend as much time as you can in the area, but just try to be responsible. Um, again, a lot of every town in the Pinelands has a great recycling center. Every county has a recycling center. So there's no reason for people to take their trash and debris and dump it out in the Pinelands. So that's something I'd really discourage. And uh, when, you, when you see this, when you're out there, it's definitely something sad. 
and uh, you know, really, really wish people would just take better care of our backyard. Um, if you see someone doing some of these activities, uh, there's a number right here. This is the number to call the DEP hotline. Um, it's a one eight seven seven nine two seven six three three seven. And if you see someone with a wildlife violation, uh, the conservation officers, their number is one eight five five six four eight zero four seven seven. Uh, and they will respond. I mean, it's such a large area; they can't be right there. But if you let them know something's going on, they'll definitely uh, make a good effort to to check it out. Um, like Andrew said earlier on, if you want to learn more about the area, here's our website right here. This is the website for the uh, New Jersey Pine Lands. Um, so, you know, please uh, check us out. Try to give us a call or uh, all the information we have. Uh, and if you like this program, our next uh, large Pine Lands education program is going to be uh, in June. Uh, June, we partner with uh, Stockton University and we do what's called the Summer Short Course or the Pine Lands Summer Short Course. And it's going to take place on Friday, June 23rd, uh, 2003 at uh, Stockton's Cramer Hall, which is out in the little town of Hamilton, New Jersey. So on that note, I think I'll uh, wrap up. I'll check the chat right now to see if there's any more questions. Okay. All right, everyone, uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, I appreciate your your feedback, and uh, you know, um, if you can, if you get an opportunity, uh, you know, try to get out there. There's lots of state parks in the Pinelands. There's lots of county parks, uh, and most of the municipalities even have some small uh, areas as well. And uh, it's all good opportunities for Pinelands habitat. Um, so with that, I'll uh, kind of let that go. Uh, thanks for everybody checking it out, and I uh, look forward to seeing you out there. Uh, in, in future adventures in the pilots. Yes, thank you so much, Joel. We really appreciate you coming back and, and talking to us and, you know, giving us this virtual hike through through the pine lands. So um, if anybody has any any other questions or you think of anything, Joel has his uh, email address on the screen. So please contact them. We can contact the Pine Lands Commission um, for, for further information. So. Um, I'd just like to thank Joel and everybody for attending today and be safe, be well, and as it warms up, please get outside and enjoy everything that New Jersey has to offer.